All right, welcome to our Employer in Virtual Residence series for fall 2022. I want to thank Joy Bertan from Simon & Schuster for joining us today. So Joy, we're just going to dive right on in. And so if you can tell us a little bit about who you are at Simon & Schuster and maybe a little bit about Simon & Schuster as a company. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. It's so nice to meet you. So I am the head of talent acquisition for Simon & Schuster. I've been with the company for almost 15 years now. And what I do in my role is all of the hiring for every single position from the executive level on down through the uh, entry level hires. I also run the internship programs, our mentorship programs, our publishing prologue, which is a um, uh, a week-long series on, on careers in book publishing. I run a ton of in-house training and development programs, our mentorship programs. Um, I sit on the diversity council. I have my hands in a little bit of everything. Um, I've been doing this for a very, very long time. So within my 30 plus year career, uh, the first half of my career, was in entertainment marketing. So I have experience in music, TV, film, magazines, and now books. The first half was as an ent in entertainment marketing. So I started as a marketing person. And then once I had my fill of all of that, which is a, that entertainment marketing world is, is tough and everything you read about is true from the 80s. Um, I made a major career shift and became a recruiter. Back in the day, we were called headhunters. And I worked within still the world of media and spent the bulk of my career as a recruiter within Time Inc. And um, then joined Simon & Schuster, you know, almost 15 years ago now. So I come to the recruiting place a little bit like a unicorn because my background isn't in traditional human resources. Um, what makes me unicorn is because I've had many of the jobs that I recruit for. And because I've actually been in the industries on the line in so many jobs, I have a better understanding of what the roles are really all about. So it gives me a little different perspective. So um, Simon & Schuster is one of the the big five, as you as you hear about, um, we are a trade publishing house, primarily based in uh, New York City in Rockefeller Center, right by the Christmas tree, actually. Uh, we do also have offices in the UK, in Australia, India, uh, Toronto, um, and we do have a small presence in uh, Massachusetts as well, a few of our imprints, and we own our own distribution facilities in both uh, New Jersey and uh, Tennessee, and we distribute not only Simon Schuster books, but for most of the other publishing houses as well. Thanks, Joy. Actually, as you were talking about your the various roles you had, that's what I was thinking when I'm often talking with students, They when they're thinking of publishing, they often think of it as just the editing portion of it. So I know we have a lot of folks on the call, and that that might be their heart, it might be their thing, but publishing is made up of a lot of different things. And because you've done these roles in the past, maybe you can give the students a sense of the various departments um, and, and roles they could have within a publishing company. Absolutely. So that's, it's good we talk about this right away because when people stumble across book publishing as a potential career, first of all, they stumble across it like, like it's like an awakening. People think that books magically appear on the shelves. Like they have no idea. And then all of a sudden they're like, huh, that's a job. They think that the only jobs available in the world of book publishing are editors. And, and yes, we have many editors in the world of book publishing, but that's only one piece of an extraordinarily collaborative organization. Everyone thinks they want to be an editor. In fact, Everybody thinks they want to be an editor, but once they once everyone sees exactly what that really means, nine out of ten people don't want to do it. It's not what they think it is, and they wind up in another role. And but the reason they say they want to be an editor is because they want to have their hands on that manuscript. They want to work with the author. They want to work on on the creation of that book. And truth be told, 
every single person in the world of book publishing has their hand on the creation of that book at some point along along its path through the industry. In the editorial board meeting, there are not only the editors, but the contracts people, the subsidiary rights people, the marketing people, the publicity people, the production people, the managing ed people, the sales people. Everybody is in the room because if you're going to, if an editor is looking to acquire a book, well, then a lot of conversations have to be had. First of all, when do we want, when do we want this book on the shelf? And that's when managing ed and comes into play. They are the people who set the whole plan and walk the book by the hand through the whole process. The contracts and subsidiary rights people have to be in that acquisition meeting because we have to know what are we acquiring? Is it just the book or do we want audio rights or foreign language rights or do we want rights for, um, for, for, for how many years? There's a million options. So they're in the room. It, the marketing and publicity people are in the room because if we're acquiring the book, who's going to read it? We have to figure out immediately who's, who is the audience and how are we going to reach them? They're in the room from day one. And the salespeople, no one thinks about sales and book publishing. They're a critical player. If the editor can't convince the salespeople that we should acquire this book because it's going to be amazing, salespeople get to ixnay the whole thing. Salespeople also get the final say on what the cover looks like. It's, you know, when, when, when we say sales, it's not about, uh, it's not about selling in, the book in a bookstore. It's about the developing the relationships with all the channels around the world that take our books in and get them to the readers. So there are so many options and every single person in the industry is an amazing writer. Every single person in the industry is a voracious reader. I read in HR, I'd say four to six a week. Um, that's just who we are. We're book people. So there are so many choices. And that's why this is an industry that you really have to try. I really encourage internships in this industry so you can get a sense for how all these pieces come together. Oh, I love that because that goes to my next question is actually, as you were talking, I was thinking about how many students come into my office and they say that they want an internship, but the you know they're in D.C., um, and think of New York as being the hub, but what would you advise a student that's in DC, maybe, you know, in the fall or spring semester, there, there are some smaller publishing um, companies here. We have GU Press that's on campus. What would you, what would you say like, hey, this would be a good thing to do during the academic year? Sure. Um, Great yeah. question. So good news um, what we've learned in the past, so, so Simon & Schuster runs three internship programs a year, fall, spring, and summer. Many publishing houses do that, including the agents. So when thinking about internships and book publishing, you shouldn't necessarily only look at the publishing houses, but you should look at the agents as well. And there are trade publishing houses, there are academic publishing houses, there, there are so many different versions. What we learned in the past couple of years is that we can totally manage virtual internships. I have not missed a single internship session since we went, since the pandemic started, not a single one. We've learned how to do it. And so, whereas in the past, I had to bring local students from the tri-state area in for the fall and spring session, and only use summer for those who are out of state. Now I know I don't even have to do that. So I think that moving forward, even if we go back into the office full-time, which I really, I highly doubt that will ever be the case. I think that I will always keep at least one of my sessions fully remote so that I can work with students outside. One of the greatest things for me during the pandemic was that I was able to work with students from colleges and universities all over the country that I never had a chance to work with before. I've had Georgetown students in my internship programs fall and spring over the past three years um, to great success virtually. So it's totally doable. So 
So there's that. And so the fall and spring, the whereas summer is a full-time commitment for eight weeks, fall and spring in the world of Simon and Schuster is two days a week, 16 hours for eight weeks. But let's just say that's too much time. You can't do it. Your, your classes are too demanding, totally understandable. There's other options. Um, what you can do and what we'd like to see is if you're involved, if there's a campus newspaper, if there's a literary, campus literary journal, if you get a job at a bookstore, we love that. We love bookstore experience. If, you if you're involved in a book club or you have a book blog, um, all of those kinds of things. We, we're looking for little snippets that show that you're a reader um, and that you're interested in the industry. So don't panic if you can't squeeze in internships during the fall and spring. I get it. I, I have, a, I have a, a senior in college as a daughter myself, so I know how busy things can get. Um, don't panic. There are things that you can do that are, that are, that are smaller commitments that will also give you a little bit of a, a heads up. Well, that's excellent. It's the same. I've, I've heard this advice from others, but I liked it. Now I have it on the recording. Yeah, it? now you have, <laughs> now you can hold everyone to it. That's perfect. There you go. Because <laughs> like bookstores and the and all of the things that they can do on campus, which has been which yeah, yeah, we love bookstore experience. And if you if you have a a blog, if you're involved in a book blog, we love that kind of thing. Yeah. Cool. So the other thing that I was thinking of as you were talking about, of course, are the internships like Simon & Schuster internships and timelines because our students are very conscious of like, when when do I apply? What does it look like? How early should I apply? So I, I guess I'm thinking two things. One is like internship timelines and then for entry level folks. Like when, sure. should, they start sure. looking, when should they start applying? Sure. Okay. So so I my internship programs are, are fairly small. So I only pull nine students in for each session. But remember, all of the houses have internship programs. And remember, the agents, too, look at academic publishing. So there are a lot of options. I tend to start my recruiting for my interns a little ahead of the curve. So when I look for summer interns, I tend to start right before Thanksgiving. Right. So I'll I'll post this the summer program at some point in November when I'm looking to hire for fall. I do it in this. I. I tend to keep some of the people who are interested in summer in mind for fall, too, because I like to hire the fall interns before school ends. So I need I need to do that within the spring semester before I lose everybody and everyone leaves campus, right? So I tried, you know, around probably as soon as I get the summer interns done, I start to look, work on fall. And then the spring interns, I usually start looking um, around September for the spring interns. So I just finished the, the recruiting for that. Um, you can keep an eye. I would just keep an eye on all of the, the career sites directly, but there's, you can look at bookjobs.com. You can look at publishers lunch. You can look at shelf awareness. There are certainly industry um, daily free industry um, emails that come out where you can keep an eye, but um, you definitely want to um, keep an eye out, but we do post. And then we, you know, you, uh, obviously, you know, we use handshake and, you know, we have Simon & Schuster has a, a work at Simon & Schuster Instagram page. We post a lot of stuff there. Um, for those that are graduating in May, don't start looking for full-time jobs until April. The reason is that jobs in the world of book publishing tend to go very quickly. Right. So if if you can't start within three weeks of when you're interviewing, it's too soon. So if you're not going to be graduating till mid-May, if you're going to be looking to work right away, April would be a good time to start. If you start looking now, here's what happens. So I'll start to see your resume come in for positions, and then I'll see that you're not graduating until May. 
So I, I, I'll see that right away. And I, I really won't take the time to really look through your resume and cover letter as I would normally, I would put it aside because you couldn't start right now. And then if you do it more, then I'm going to see your name a lot. And then I'm not going to remember why I've seen your name so many times. And I'm going to think, oh, I've seen that resume already because it comes up too often. And if I haven't utilized you for something in the past, you just get caught up in that. Oh, I've seen that person already. So you want to come out of the gate fresh and ready to go when you can start working. So April would be the, the time to start, not before that. Thanks, Joy. That's it's that's good to to know, and it's what I usually advise. But it's all, often like harder advice for like on a campus where they're they're getting timelines for things like finance and consulting, which are right. Better. Right. Oh. Those industries run completely different. They have these training programs. They hire classes of people, um, and so they do that early, and then they get them into this. I get it, and you think that you're missing the boats. But believe me, you're not. We just don't operate that way. So in most creative fields, it, there's not, they're not going to hire a class of people in bulk. They'll be one-off jobs. But the good news is that the world of book publishing is apprentice-driven in entirety. So that means that there are entry-level jobs in every single department in the business. And they open up all the time. So no one, no one panic. The jobs are going to be available in the spring, I assure you. And before we started this meeting, you were saying that hiring has been pretty solid so far. Oh my gosh. Hiring is the book publishing world is booming. We have hired so many people. We've added additional heads. We've added new imprints, new departments. Um, business is booming. You know, during the pandemic, people were stuck in the house. They started to read. Um, yes, they streamed a lot, but now they're getting tired of streaming and they're bored of the streaming. And so they're picking up even more books. Um, business in book publishing is booming and we're hiring like crazy. Well, and that's good news. And then so like the students that are on the call, they're like, yes, I'm, you know, I'm ready for when, when I need to apply. Let's go to the, the, resumes, cover letters, skills section. So right. yes. So advice that you can give in there, like what are, what do you see? What does a good resume look like? What does a good cover letter look like? Sure. What are there skills you're looking for? Okay. So let's talk about that. So, so this is sort of a creative industry, right? So you don't have to use the traditional resume formats. You can use something a little snazzier. <laughs> for lack of a better word. So I like to suggest that everyone take a look at canva.com. They have tons of free resume formats. And the reason I like a different kind of more modern format is that it suits a new grad better. Because sometimes you'll have a lot of volunteer experience or you'll have a lot of uh, campus activities that you're involved with. Um, you may have a lot of interest. It gives you an opportunity to take a different format that may suit all of that experience a little bit better. So it's perfectly acceptable to use a little bit more of a modern format. Some of them even have a little pop of color. Totally fine. Um, totally fine. And because we're looking at the resumes electronically now, if you feel like you have the experience and you need a second page, don't panic. Totally fine to have a second page. Now, if you need a second page because you want to list six or eight uh, jobs within retail or food service, you don't need a second page for that. You can uh, you utilize a section called previous experience and you can sort of group all of those types of jobs together. Do not eliminate food service or retail experience from your job. Leave them on your resume. The reason they're important is that they demonstrate fantastic people skills. All, no matter what anyone tells you about resumes, remember this. 
all experience is valuable experience and relevance, and it matters. Do not take things off at this point. You can, if it's if it becomes too much, you can condense it, like I said, and say and say previous look, put a little section previous experience and say uh, from 2010 to 2015 had multiple um, multiple positions within local coffee shops um, in these roles developed great customer service and uh, and and management skills. Right, you can group them all together. You don't have to list every single one, but they're important especially because in the past three years, no one has really had a lot of opportunity to develop those people skills. Everyone has been in their homes. And so the people skills are critical for new grads. So there's that. Um, also, there's another section that's important on your resume, and that is skills and interests. Within skills and interests, you want to put things like, I don't know, InDesign, HTML, PowerPoint, you know, whatever, you know, software and technical skills. Definitely include social media. Don't assume that people know that you have it. Some people don't. That's where you'll also put languages, but only if you're fluent. If you took, you know, a, a year of of, of French in high school, no one really cares. Um, if But if you're fluent, that's where you put that. And then the interests are really important because this is a creative industry. And this is your chance to give the person who's reading the resume a little glimmer of who you are as a person. And in book publishing, we hire people that match the books. So people who work in lifestyle, right, on lifestyle books may be master cupcake bakers or may love the uh, home remodeling shows on TV or maybe be gardening. Um, people who are interested in working on the nonfiction books, there may be some interesting, you know, interests that they have, um, whether it be about politics or history. You know, so there are clues within the interests that lead us to determine whether that's a really good fit for those books. But it also sparks a conversation for someone to want to call you in for an interview. And once in the interview, to, to, to start the conversation off in a in little bit more of um, a friendly conversational manner. So skills and interests, really important. Um, the most important thing, however, is the cover letter. Now, I know you're going to meet with all kinds of companies and all kinds of hiring managers and talent acquisition people. And most industries will tell you, don't bother with a cover letter. Nobody cares. In fact, my own daughter called me just last week to say everyone I'm meeting with says cover letters are a waste of time. My response is they are not a waste of time. They are your writing sample. They shouldn't be two pages long, but within a, a brief paragraph or two, that's your chance to show that you're a great writer. And what you talk about in the cover letter is not the classes that you're taking and not a review of what's on your resume, but rather what's your passion. Why do you want to work in book publishing? And why do you want to work on those specific kinds of books? Don't be afraid to gush, book people gush. That's your opportunity to say, this is why I want this job. I can read the resume for myself. I can see what kind of experience you have. I know you went to Georgetown. I know you're really smart. You don't have to explain that to me. But what you need to explain is why you need to have your resume jump out of the pile. And, the, and by the way, I don't even look at the resume until after I read the cover letter. And if there's no cover letter, I don't look at the resume. Aha, there you go, right? <laughs> Most people do not include cover letters. Yeah, that's, um, and so it's interesting, you know, so some of the folks on the call, like um, if I've done employer chats with like media organizations or entertainment, they'll say, don't give me anything more than one because I'm probably not going to look at it. You know, so it's, it, but publishing is all about words. So it's like exactly in this world. And I will say one more thing about the resume. So a resume is a snapshot of your accomplishments, not a job description. 
most people, as they're building a resume, they talk about, you know, all their tasks in their jobs. I know what the tasks are. I'm doing this 30 years. I know exactly what's involved in every single job you can possibly imagine. But what I want to know is what did you accomplish while you were there? So a nice thing to do is to make a list before you do a resume, make a list of everything that you, all the projects that you were involved in and all the jobs. And there could be accomplishments even in, 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 in retail or administrative jo- roles, you know, you could talk about how many calls you managed or how many, you know, how many customers came in on a, on a day-to-day basis. Um, so there, there is an opportunity to do that. I mean, obviously it doesn't have to be so in depth, but, but it, sh- it is not a job description. It is a, a snapshot of your accomplishments. Thanks, Joy. That's, that's also something that we usually, you know, have to go through with resumes and it's all class years. So don't think if you're a senior, or junior, you know, all class years, we've seen it and had to had to. definitely the other question I had for you. And I, I put it in the chat, but I don't know, cause you had mentioned, um, and this is more, well, this is, this is more of a career advisor question, but this is probably going to help all, all, all of you is that, um, applicant tracking systems. Do you guys use it? Because that's, oh, yeah. You do. And so like the templates, it doesn't, doesn't impact like if they use a canvas. Oh, no, no, no. You know what? They come in as PDFs. Okay. No, they're, they're perfectly fine. They, I, you, you upload a PDF and I look at it exactly as you put it in. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, good. Cause that's yeah. also another one where it's like talking to different people. So we're like, I just want to know the stuff <laughs> and others are like, give me the design. So that's, that's often um, like it's sometimes it's it's like employer specific, you know, what they want. So like Simon and Schuster, you've heard it, like what they want. Yeah, no, you know what? Most companies have applicant tracking systems. It's the only way to keep track of the resumes. Um, if anyone on the call is a designer looking to go into either digital design or cover design or interior, you know, when I say interior, I don't mean furniture, I mean the inside of a book. Um those resumes should most definitely have a little bit more of, of a creative flair to them and should most definitely include the link to your portfolio. Thanks. That's a good point. That's We have a small, small, but um, passionate group of students that are interested in design here. So I yeah. don't see it all the time, but it's important to, to you know think about that portfolio if you are a designer. Most definitely. Okay, let's see. So moving moving along, I'm thinking like we did the cover letter resume and I'm thinking, okay, you made it to the interview stage. And so if they're if they're talking to you, Joy, or somebody on your team, like are they, what are the things that you're looking for? Um, I imagine it's similar to like what you're looking for in resume and, and passionate about books. Is there maybe just, you know, some things off the top of your head that you're like, you want to hit this and be careful of this? Sure. So so when you when you are um, now at the stage where you have an interview. And um, a lot of the interviews are 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 still via Zoom, so so there's that. Um, um, you want to be able to first of all have done a little research on who you're going to meet with, so that you know if you know if we're talking about book publishing specific, you know who they are, what books they've worked on, what their career trajectory is. They're, you know, book people are very easily found if you Google their names. So you definitely want to know who they are, what they worked on. You also want to do a little research on, on the company, know what's what what's going on with their imprint. Does everyone know what I mean when I say imprint? So um, an imprint, so when you look at the when you look at the back of a book, hold on, I'll show you. You see when you look at the back of the book, you see at the very bottom to that little that little symbol that's Scrimner. So on the back of each book, there's a usually you see which imprint. Each imprint is its own little publishing unit, has its own publisher, its own editorial and marketing and publicity people. Each imprint publishes a specific genre of book. So that Scrimner is home to Hemingway, Fitzgerald. It's all literary fiction. Um, Atria is you know commercial upmarket fiction and it, lots of international uh, books. Uh, SNS is big narrative nonfiction, Walter Isaacson, David McCullough, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Um, so you want to be able to know the, the imprint of the of the people that you're, you're talking about and, and what books that, that have come out 
such and such. And then you also want to be prepared with what you've read recently, because every single person is going to say, what have you read recently that you loved? Now, you don't don't feel pressured to have to say books from that specific imprint or company because book people read broadly. It's totally fine. Um, You should know what they've put out recently and be able to come. And if you have read one of the books or if you're looking forward to reading one of the books, um, but but you can certainly talk about books that you've read more broadly. Um, Definitely. So when I'm interviewing somebody, I want them to be engaged. Like the more, now I know you're going to be nervous and that's okay, but try to just think of it as a conversation with a friend, because the more engaged you are, the more you talk about how excited you are to be able to have the conversation and to, to work with people who work with books, which is something you've always wanted to do. The more engaged you are, the better the conversation will go. Um, you can tell, um, you know, it's best to tell stories, right? About programs that you were involved with or projects that you were involved with and how you got to be involved and what your role was and then what the outcome was. You're looking for situation, action, and results, you know, in in conversations. Um, You want to be able to talk about why, what led you to this, to this, this moment where you're even talking about a career in book publishing, I the first question I always ask is, why books? And then I also won't say anything. I just pause. Um, and so I want you to tell me why. Like, I really want you to engage and tell me why. So the best conversations um, really um, are, are very passion-driven. Um, you know, we, we know a little bit about what your experience is already. So we just want to know, why do you want to do this? And And... And, and what has led you to this point? You know, we'll ask about some of the, the experiences you've had, whether they be internships or um, volunteer work while at school. Um, we'll ask, um, one of the reasons we ask what you're reading is we wanna see how up on, on what's new you are. Um, we wanna see if you follow in certain situations, if it's a marketing or a publicity job, we wanna know, we may ask a little things a few questions to hint around to see how up you are on trends, how active you are on social media. Um, you know, we want to see what kind of a writer you are. So we'll, we'll ask questions. We want to see, oh, we want to know how you organize your day. Because the past three years, everyone's been working virtually. A lot of companies are still virtual. We want to know that you can organize your day and what tricks and tips you have that you utilize for that. Because in the world of book publishing, there's not a lot of handholding. We're gonna throw you in. Obviously we'll teach you what you need to know, but we wanna know that you can manage meetings and your own work and how are you gonna reach out and what kind of, you know, based on the kind of experience you've had, what, what, uh, work cultures fit you best? Were they very busy? Were they very slow? Did you have a lot of autonomy? Were you closely managed? That kind of thing is important too. I think that's great. And, you know, and I'm looking at time and I want to make sure those of you who are joining live have a chance to ask me, Joy, some questions. And I'm thinking, Joy, is there any, we, we've talked a lot, a lot of things. Is there any last things that you want to say to the folks on the recording? Um. You know, the the book publishing business is a small world. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of patience. But do know that your resumes are not going into an endless pit. Um, I look at all the resumes that come in, and I know many of my peers do as well. You may not be called for a specific role, but you may get a call out of the blue Because sometimes I just put resumes aside for other opportunities and call those people at a later point to say, hey, I know you applied to this. We, you know, we we didn't get to you then, but now I have this opportunity. What do you think? And so just have patience. Um, The roles, the entry level roles open up all the time. And um, and and sometimes you have to, you know, broaden your horizons a little bit as to is as to what you're interested in, but um, but have patience. 
there's, there's room for everybody. Thank you so much, Joy. Um, for those of you who watched on the recording, I hope you got a lot out of it. And for those of you who are alive, if you can just hold, hold a sec while I stop the recording.